In this corner, we have the newest contender, the lightweight Seastar S30, weighing in at just 1.8 kilograms with a 30 millimeter aperture, 150 millimeter focal length, and an IMX662 sensor. It's budget friendly and travel ready, coming in at just $349. It's here to deliver wide field views for a small price. And it is going head to head against the Seastar S50, weighing in at 2.5 kilograms with a 50 millimeter aperture and 250 millimeter focal length with an IMX 462 sensor. It's a powerhouse for deep sky explorers and is priced at just $499. This heavyweight packs the ability to capture the finest details of the night sky. The Seastar S30 and the S50 are pretty similar, but they have some key differences. And People who are trying to get into astrophotography for the first time or maybe seasoned astrophotographers who are looking into getting their first cheap smart telescope are wondering which one should I get. So we'll take a look at both of these, look at some of the key differences and maybe the information I give you today will help you decide which one you should get. And off the bat, we can decide which one we want to get right now by answering two simple questions. The first one is, do you want a Seastar right now? It's the end of November and the Seastar S30 isn't scheduled to be shipped until the end of December. So if you want one right now, then the Seastar S50 is probably what you want because they're in stock in most of the astronomy stores, they're stock at ZWO, so you could probably get your hands on one within a couple of days. But if your budget is your number one priority and you want to save some money, then the Seastar S30 is the one you want to wait for. It's only a few weeks left and you'll save $150 over the Seastar S50. And at the making of this video, the Seastar S50 is actually on sale for $449. I don't know how long the sale will last, but Maybe that $50 discount is enough for the scale to tip in the favor of the S50 for you because you can get that at a discount and get it now. Now that we got those questions out of the way, let's take a look at some of their differences and then see what else we can use to decide which one is best for us. And the most obvious difference that people point out and the first thing that people see when they see the listings online is their size difference. So I have them here and they are side by side. You can see that they're kind of the same height. Of course, the Seastar S30 is on its tripod and the Seastar S50 is not. If it wasn't, it would be much taller. But when we look at the individual units themselves, there is a size difference. And in the world of astrophotography, size matters in both directions because there are advantages and disadvantages of both being big and small. The S50 weighs two and a half kilograms or about five and a half pounds. In this scenario, the S50 is bulkier and we live in a time where a five and a half pound fully automated telescope is bulky. The S30 on the other hand is 30% lighter. That sounds like a lot, but it's really only a difference of about half a kilogram or one and a half pounds. And looking at the size dimensions, the S30 is only 19% shorter, only 2% less thick and 39% less wide, which makes it a little bit more portable. The tripod is also smaller adding to the portability. And for adults, the weight difference is probably not that much. But if you're planning on using these with kids or if your kids will operate these at some point in the future, then one and a half pounds may be enough to tip the weight in favor of the S30 because it is lighter, it is smaller, it is easier to handle. Uh, you need smaller hands for this. Of course, you can you know one single handedly uh, use the S50 as well, but it is bulkier, you know, it's thicker, especially around the base here. It's more square as opposed to like a little rectangular rectangle. So you can see just the differences here. And the slightly smaller size of the S30 makes it more portable. And both of these come with cases that help both of these remain portable. This is what the S50 case looks like, which stores the telescope and the tripod. I unfortunately don't have the case for the S30, but the production units that will get shipped to consumers will have a case. But you can imagine that the case will look smaller than the S50 because the telescope itself is smaller and also the tripod is much smaller than the S50. So it's up for you to decide whether the slightly smaller size is enough for you to decide on the S30 or you just don't care and the size shouldn't be a a factor at all, in which case something like the price would be. The optics of these two telescopes are also very similar. They're both F5 telescopes. The aperture difference is 50 millimeters versus 30 millimeters or about 40% and that's pretty significant. Their respective focal lengths are 250 millimeters and 150 millimeters and the differences affect their field of view and the overall resolution of the image. And the size of the aperture affects how much light gets through to the camera sensor as shown in this diagram. You can clearly see that the S30 is letting in less light than the S50, but it kind of makes up for it with a more sensitive sensor, which we'll talk about soon. Thanks to Queeve the Lazy Geek for showing us this simulator. The slightly larger aperture and focal length of the S50 means you can get closer to your objects, which means you can look farther and get more detail than the S30, especially when you start zooming in and looking things at 
at the pixel range. And the slightly higher resolution is more prominent when you start looking at objects like star clusters, galaxies, the moon, and the sun. Looking at NGC 869 here, this is straight out of the C-Star with a similar integration time of about an hour. There's no mosaic here. The stars on the S50 look better in my opinion when we zoom in. And although we get more detail out of the S50, we can see that the S30 fits more into its field of view because the field of view is much wider. And when we look at nebulae, we can see similar effects on the stars, but the S30 ends up catching more detail in a shorter period of time than the S50 because of its sensor. And most people will pay attention to the nebulae itself more than the stars in images like this. And when we compare the moon, the S50 also gets closer and we can see some more details, especially in the craters. Now the sharpening on the S30 still drives me crazy, but I was assured by ZWO that their developers are aware of the issues and they are working on a fix. And ZWO did tell me that they are working on a software update that will go out to all these systems soon that will include AI noise reduction. That's going out in the next release. I don't have any more detail beyond that, but I'm hoping that when it does come out that we have control over how much AI noise reduction happens. So since the S50 gets you closer to your objects, you may be wondering, is this better for planetary imaging? I can tell you for sure that the S30 is not a planetary telescope. You can try it. You may be able to see the Galilean moons. You can see maybe the ears of Saturn and maybe Titan if it's there, but it is not a planetary telescope. You need much bigger aperture and focal length to be able to get detail on planets like this. And with that said, the S50 is probably not good for planets either. The only solar system objects that I would use either of these for are the moon, the sun, and comets that come nearby the Earth. So we can look at Jupiter, for example, and through the S30, it looks tiny. And we can make out the Galilean moons. And with the S50, we can do the same, but they look a little bit bigger. And the moons are actually easier to see with the S50. And we can expect a similar view of Saturn. I wouldn't even try Mars with any of these. Mars is really tiny, even at its brightest and closest. And if you zoom into Jupiter all the way and play with the brightness, on the S30, it's still a blob, can't really see anything. Maybe a hint of the Jovian atmospheric bands, but admittedly, the bands on the S50 look a lot better. It's easier to resolve, but even then, it's pretty bad. But for someone who's trying to take pictures of planets for the first time, this may be great. In my opinion, neither of these scopes are good for planets but I am working on a video about what makes a good planetary telescope with some examples coming up uh, whenever I finish recording that one. And we already briefly talked about this, but the size of the optics also have an effect on your field of view, how much of space you can see. So with the S30, the wider field of view lets you see more of the sky without having to do mosaics. And that can save you a lot of time because your single to noise ratio for any particular region of that image would be much stronger than the S50 if you were doing it in mosaic. Capturing images in non-mosaic mode in, with either of these scopes mean that you, your single to noise ratio for any particular part of that image is much better than if you were to do a mosaic, even if it's 1x mosaic or a rotation mosaic. So for example, here's M81 and M82 in the C-Star S30. I was able to fit both objects in frame and image them for 90 minutes and they fit perfectly. And even on the bottom, we have the Garland galaxy that showed up in view. And this is all just non-mosaic. I took 90 minutes of exposures. Aside from some of the field rotation in the corner, the main objects that I was imaging stayed within frame and they got the full benefit of the 90 minutes. And here's the same region with the S50. I had to rotate it 90 degrees because I couldn't fit both galaxies in the same view. They were just a little bit too far. Either M82 started to disappear or the arms of M81 was just out of view. You might be wondering, why does it matter? Because we can do a mosaic, just rotate the sensor on the S50 and make the field of view look exactly the same or maybe even better than the S30 because we can get a little bit closer. Well, because rotating the image or just making any kind of framing adjustment will take images in mosaic mode. So even though I shot this region for 90 minutes, the amount of data I collected for each pixel is significantly less than if I didn't do a mosaic. And that's because of how the C-Star does its mosaics. You can see that it kind of spirals around and each of the regions could get as little as maybe one tenth the amount of data depending on what's being imaged at that particular time. So even though it says I have enough frames for 90 minutes worth of data, I don't have 90 minutes worth of data everywhere. 
And for the most part, it's okay. If you're just looking at the live stacked images, you won't really notice the difference. But if you were to take these images out and you process them yourself, you may end up seeing more noise just all over because you know, you're expecting 90 minutes of data, but it's not really 90 minutes. It could be 90 minutes for a particular part of your image, but not the whole thing. So the field of view is something to consider because the S30 is wider. And while we're on that topic, from experience, I know that a wider field of view setup is much easier for beginners. So if you are just starting astrophotography, that should be something that you keep in mind. But again, with the caveat that the field of view on the S50 and the field of view in the S30 are not that far apart. They're both F5 telescopes, just very slightly different. It's like comparing one cat to a slightly smaller cat. Now let's talk a little bit about the sensor. For most people, it won't really matter because they are both the same size. They give you the same output resolution, which is 1080 by 1920 pixels. And they both have the same pixel size, which is 2.9 microns. And on top of that, both of these use the exact same narrowband filters and they output their files in the exact same way. S50 has a sensor called the IMX462 and the S30 has an IMX662. They are brothers. The 662 is a little bit newer. The S50 has a smaller dynamic range where the S30 has a much deeper dynamic range. And what that means is that it's, it'll be much harder to oversaturate your images. And the live stack images you see could look a little bit more vibrant because the color range is much wider than this one. One benefit of the uh, of the IMX 662 is that if ZWO ever decides that they want to allow you longer exposures, longer than 30 seconds, maybe two, three, five minutes, then the deeper dynamic range or the higher dynamic range of the S30's sensor will benefit because you'll be able to take longer images without saturating each of those pixels. With that said, the S50 actually gets better resolution because the pixel size of the sensor, 2.9 microns, fits the focal length of 250 millimeters a little bit better. There's a whole topic about sampling, oversampling, and undersampling, and what's good and what's not. I'm not going to go over that. I'll just say that the pixel size fits the S50 a little bit better. But again, the difference is pretty minuscule. It's, it's very small. But if your biggest consideration is just a better sensor, then the S30 has the better sensor. And on top of a better sensor, the S30 also has that tiny wide field camera that actually comes in pretty handy, especially for lunar and solar gazing, because you can center those objects using the wide field and then switch over to the narrower telescope uh, camera and lens here pretty easily. That camera currently doesn't support Milky Way or Star Trails images, but the way ZWO responded to that question is that I think that they will at some point, and if they do, then this will be an amazing killer telescope because it'll be able to do both deep space, planetary, and wide field. And now let's talk about the setup. These two are incredibly easy to set up, but the S30 actually gets one point from me because it doesn't need precise leveling. I know a couple of people have asked, you know, because they give non-adjustable tripod legs, does that mean that you don't have to precisely level this. And ZWO confirmed, and I did a really dumb test of just two and a half degrees off balance, off level, and it worked beautifully. I did that as just a proof of concept and the horizontal calibration worked like magic and I was able to use it the rest of the night without any problems. So now you can just eyeball the level of the telescope and you're good to go. But the S50 needs you to be within two degrees of completely level, otherwise it won't let you move forward. I've been doing outreach of some kind for more than 12 years now, mostly with my 6SE SCT, where big and bulky that I carry around, set up somewhere and people look through it. But I've taken the S50 out to star parties a couple of times already and it's a hit every single time. I plan on taking the S30 to its first star party in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that. I think there's a couple of hundred people registered for it, so we'll see how that goes. I've had someone ask me which of these I would recommend for their outreach activities where they plan on buying multiples. And I think if you're in a similar situation, I think that's where the cost comes more into play because you can either get more of them or you can save yourself some money and invest in other outreach activities. I did tell them for outreach, I think the S30 is probably the better choice because of some of, some of his easier features such as the leveling, the wider field of view. And as I said, I think wide field of views are easier for beginners. And when, when it comes to star parties, we don't expect people to you know, look at the screen, you know, zoom in and say, hey, 
Like, these two stars are five pixels more bloated than the S50, and the crater on the moon looks weird. You know, it should look sharper. Sure, you might have people do that, but most of the people won't care. They'll see the image as a whole, and they will enjoy it. Only time people will notice the resolution differences, the star bloatedness between the two of them, the finer details on the S50 is when you start processing them yourself and you zoom in and you look at things pixel by pixel. It is really hard to see on, on, a, on a phone screen or an iPad, especially when you're at an event and you're trying to show as many people the wonders of space as fast as possible. They're just gonna look, move on, and you point to the next object. So that's just my opinion when it comes to outreach. I think the S30 will treat me a lot better at my star parties, and I think it'll do the same for others. Oh, one fun thing about both of these when it comes to outreach is that they both now have guest mode. It's a guest mode in the app, so it's not a function of these. It's the function of the C-Star app, where you can actually have up to eight devices connect to a single C-Star. What actually happens is one mobile device connects to the C-Star, controls it, and every other device connects and just sees what's being shown on the controller mobile device. So it's pretty cool. I tested this out very briefly with just two devices and it works really well. Anyways, I hope I gave you enough information to make your decision, you know, get this faster, get this cheaper. This is wider, this is deeper. These are both portable. These are both great for astrophotography, for outreach, etc. So things to keep in mind. And if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask. And if you're wondering about more pictures that I've taken through either of these systems, I usually post them on our Discord server. So please feel free to join and see what I post. And you can also feel free to share your own photos. It doesn't have to be from smart telescopes. It can be anything. Your cell phone astrophotography is also accepted. If you're planning on ordering either of these scopes, please consider using one of my referral links in the description below. Until next time, keep looking up.